Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition. And tonight's topic is pharmaceutical update by my partner, Dr. Greg Caldwell, who's my, pri my privilege and pleasure to introduce. Dr. Caldwell is a 1995 graduate of Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he also completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute in Philadelphia. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry, a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, a member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently works in Duncansville, PA, as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is diagnosis and manage anterior and posterior segment ocular disease, and has been a participant in multiple FDA investigations and trials. Dr. Caldwell has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care, practicing full-scope integrative optometry. He is a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. Dr. Caldwell is lectured extensively throughout the country in over 13 countries internationally. In 2010, he served as the president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association, and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016, and is past president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, please very warm virtual welcome to Dr. Greg Caldwell as we talk about Pharmaceutical Updates 2022. Greg, take it away. Thank you, Joe. And, uh, you know, putting this lecture together, I wasn't sure how much, you know, an update there would be, but Quite a lot uh, to update everyone out there. So I'll try and keep us respected. We're starting here about 10 after. We'll try and land it right around nine o'clock to keep that uh, or that 950-ish area um, to or 850-ish area Eastern to, to uh, um, get the right COFA amount of time in here. So, all right. So with the disclosures here, uh, the content of this activity was prepared independently by me. No one has really uh, handed me anything uh, and asked me to, to talk about it. Um, really, this lecture here is really about these next few bullet points, lecturing from Alcon all the way down to Hero, uh, advisory boards from Allergan, Sun, Alcon, uh, Inova, um, you know, receive speaker honorariums for participating in the ad boards. And, and But I don't put that up there to be, you know, to brag. Look, oh, look how much I'm doing. It's really to build webinars like this and presentations like this to kind of give you the cutting edge, keep the finger on the pulse that's out there. So that's really this, this whole disclosure slide is, is really, uh, really built around that. Um, I have no direct financial interest in any of the companies or products I'll be speaking about tonight. Uh, I do sit as the PA medical director for Involve, uh, the credentialing committee uh, and their special unit investigations. Uh, I am the chairman of the Advisory uh, Council for Diabetes for Healthcare Registries. Uh, I also just recently added diabetes to that. It's an outcome-based registry. And really, the, this last bullet point, the content and the format of this course is presented without any commercial bias and doesn't claim any superiority over any products or services that I talk about. So really, every year, the FDA approves numerous pharmaceuticals, which are called legend drugs for the management of disease. Uh, tonight, I'm just gonna kind of focus on just the ocular side. Sometimes I do this talk with a pharmacist and we fold in some of the systemic, but we're just gonna focus tonight on the pharmaceutical side uh, of this presentation. Now there is a pharmaceutical resource matrix out there. And I think it gets confusing. And I'll tell you where I hang out a lot of the time is with what's called the medical science liaison. These can be anywhere from PharmDs to PhDs to MDs, DOs, ODs. Um, we have the commercial side. We're all used for the, the commercial representative come in. Hey, let me tell you about the product. They really can't talk off label. If you say, hey, I found this, uh, this, this secondary use for it, they'll immediately just shut down. They're trained to do that. They can only talk on label, can't talk off label but they'll get you in contact with the medical science liaison that really can talk about just about anything, get you anything, get down into the granular side of it. So just last week, uh, the medical science liaison for Tepeza came into town. Uh, he's a physician assistant. We went out to dinner and really I was able to hone in a little bit more to be able to talk more comfortably about Tepeza 
whenever I uh, speak to um, presentations like this. There's clinical research, there's marketing and marketing access. So if you do wanna get in that granular, remember the medical science liaison person can be your friend. Now, when it comes to pharmaceuticals, what I've seen over the years is it gets confusing uh, what's happening out there in the market. So when a drug comes in, there's the mechanism of action, right? And I'll just say like Vuity, right? So we have Vuity that's out there and I see everything out there about, you know, it's pilocarpine, just remarketed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, the mechanism of action of the pilocarpine is not gonna change. But when I've lectured with Tracy over the many years, there's mechanism of, uh, mechanism of delivery. There's also products that might be in the same category that we'll talk about tonight, like alpha agonists, and they maybe have a different mechanism of delivery, or maybe they're focusing on a different specific type of receptor. So mechanism of action, mechanism of delivery. So for instance, a mechanism of delivery change would be like Amplify uh, that is found uh, in the Isuvis, where they're taking the lodopredinol, and maybe it's the same change. They maybe modified it a little bit, but it's still lodopredinol with that change to that carbon 20, but then they put it in uh, because the mucus barrier, they wrap it in uh, a certain mucus penetrating surfactant. They take the particles and make it small. That would be more of a mechanism of delivery change. So when you're out seeing all these new medications, see what has really changed. Is it the mechanism of action? Maybe they change it to hit a a specific receptor, alpha one, alpha two, maybe they're hitting both alpha ones and alpha twos, or did they literally change nothing with the molecule, but they're able to deliver it a little bit better by a mucus penetrating surfactant and making it smaller, making that a mechanism of delivery change. And yesterday I literally was going through my emails and I found this from Inova, and INOVA announced the positive study results demonstrating the opti OptiJet delivery technology, reducing conjunctival cell toxicity from preserved ophthalmic solutions. So basically, I'm not sure if you've seen this yet, but it's a new way to deliver the medication, right? So most drops, I'm not sure if people are aware, are 30 to 60 um, uh, microns in size. Micro, no, not microns, sorry, take that back. Microliters. The drop is 30 to 60 microliters. And the eye really only needs eight to 10. And that's why, and I don't have it in here, uh, the nano dropper came out and it's literally, it doesn't fit on all bottles, but you can screw it onto a bottle and it really funnels it down to about an N, a 10 microliter drop. I just saw them at, at Seco and I said, look, I really don't like called nano, but I really want to make sure I'm not missing anything. And they basically said, yeah, it was just kind of cutesy. It doesn't really mean nano. So most drops, right, are 30 to 60 microliters. The eye only needs eight to 10. They came out with this little thing you screw onto the top that fits most bottles that makes it 10. But I know it's taking it a, a whole different way. They're putting uh, medications in this spray for lack, which they're calling uh, the OptiJet. And it just puts a diffuse, because that's the whole thing about when you see these, the, the, these um, mechanism delivery and grinding it up to nano particular size so it can diffuse across the eye. So they're looking at, well, why should we use a bottle? Maybe there's, you know, maybe there's a better mouse trap, mouse trap out there in delivering uh, these eye drops. In a sense, this wouldn't be a drop. This would be more of a jet spray that's out there. So try and keep in mind mechanism of delivery, mechanism of action, drops, so on and so forth when we talk about pharmaceuticals. So polling question number one, going back to these medications, regarding lotopredinol e e etabinate, ophthalmic drops, What's your thoughts? We have enough formulations. They're all the same to me. Help me with the differences. Steroids are steroids, they all do the same. Or I'll put a comment in the chat box. So we've got a bunch of lotopredinols out there recently. 
So why is that? You know, why, why is that happening? And I just want to see some comments. They're all the same. Help me with the differences. Steroids are steroids. And they'll put their chat and their comment in the chat box. All right, in the Cape, I've got a lot of information. I'm going to end the poll. I'll share the results here. And uh, not seeing anything rolling in the chat box. So I see here that we have enough formulations. Uh, that seems to be uh, uh, 20, 27%. They're all the same, 3%. Help me with the differences. And I guess that's why we're here tonight. And I'm glad no one put, you know, all steroids are the same. So that's good. That's out there. All right. So let's jump into here. So steroids, ketones versus esters. This is what we were talking about. This one over here would be uh, like prednisolone. And then what happened, that would be a ketone type of steroid, prednisolone acetate. And what they've done on the carbon uh, 20 is they've changed it to an ester. So out here in this area, they've changed it. The corticosteroid, the C20 ketone is replaced with an ester. Now, why is that important? The eye has a ton of plasma cholinesterase, right? Esterase breaks down esters. And that's why really you hear lodopredinol being used in a sense, you know, as that ocular surface type of steroid. We do know it penetrates because we've seen, I have seen the increased pressures when people are on them long-term, they can get the pressure spike. That means it's getting into the anterior chamber uh, clogging up the trabecular meshwork. And then also uh, we know about uh, the cataract formation, but going from a ketone to an ester certainly increases the safety profile, right? We're decreasing that risk of interocular pressure. We're decreasing that risk of that cataract formation. So here we go. Here's all those ester steroids that are out there. And I'm hoping I I caught them all, started with Lodomax suspension back in the time, uh, 0.5. But remember, suspension separates, so you need to, to shake them. And then I think a great product that came out, at least from, a, uh, from a, uh, an indication standpoint, was Alrex. Because we all use steroids for, for, uh, for allergies, but it was really off-label. And then Alrex came along and allowed us to have an on label, which was just lodopredinol, just a lower concentration, 0.2. Then Lodomax gel came out half percent. And that basically uh, was a gel so that didn't separate out. You got the, the standard dose every single time. You didn't have to worry about the patient having to, lack of a better term, reconstitute it to get it uh, kind of shaken back up. It separated, uh, the suspension separate out like olive oil, water, salad dressings. And then Lodomax SM gel recently came out and that's 0.38%. And it doesn't seem like that's a big deal, but it's less drops and less percentage. And anytime I you know, do this with Tracy, I'll ask her from a pharmacist, you know, does going from 0.5 or half percent to quarter percent or 0.38 percent, does that really as a pharmacist like excite you? And she quickly just said, look, it's a no brainer. Anytime you have less medication going into the body, going onto the surface of the eye, that is always, you know, less side effects. And especially with steroids, right? When we're talking about the steroids, uh, it's messing around with the immune system. And we've learned from COVID, anytime you're messing around with the immune system, you know, it does, it's the, the immune system is very prissy. It's very complicated. The immune system doesn't like to be messed with. And when you're adding steroids to it, that's what you're doing. And then there was Inveltis that came out 1%. And then recently uh, we had Isuva suspension come out. Um, that was the old trade name I was keeping an eye on at KPI 121. That's when it was going through all the phase trials. And then when it gets approved, they give it a name. And so that's ISUVIS. But look at that. We have a quarter percent lotopredinol. In a pharmaceutical met, met, um, met, met, methodology way, meth, uh, mechanical way, you were talking about a drop in, you know, 
you know, 50% or 0.5% down to quarter percent. That's a big change when it talks about pharmacology. So Lodomax SM, let's talk about that. I think we're so used to all the other Lodomaxes that's out there is indicated for the, this is its indication right off the, the label, indicated for post-operative inflammation in pain following ocular surgery. So that really could be really anything if you think about it. That could be removing a foreign body. The foreign body are considered surgical codes. That could be LASIK. That could be really any type of inflammation from, uh, from, after, uh, from after some type of post-operative procedure. It's, it truly is now getting into sub-micron type of particular size. Uh, where, where they literally took, and you can see down here in this one, two, this third bullet point here under submicron, where they took the lodopredinol gel, uh, 0.38%, and it's 0 0.4, 0 0.6 microns, where the Lodomax gel, half percent, is three to five microns. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but I do some teaching in, in OCT, but a spectral domain OCT, it's five to six microns of resolution. So that's to the point there that you almost could see if it was five microns of resolution that you'd be able to pick it up on an OCT. And getting that gel down to 0.4 to 0.6 microns, that's now getting to your submicron. And that's what the SM stands for in Lodomax. Now, what happens is whenever it becomes smaller, it's able to spread across the eye quicker and now you're able for it to, uh, to spread quicker and then to get to the tissues a little bit quicker so you get a little bit better penetration. So increased concentrations de demonstrated in ocular tissues uh, by going to the smaller, quickly diffuse, you're able to get that, tish that medication um, to the cornea, to the aqueous humor, uh, following uh, installation, and that was done uh, via rabbits, but you could see that they used the half percent gel and the Lodomax uh, SM that's out there. So that's what, uh, that's what they've done with, uh, with the Lodomax SM, basically made it smaller. Now you decrease it from uh, a dosing from four times a day down to three times a day. And so again, this is kind of a, not really a change in the mechanism of action, right? It's still lodopredinol, but they've changed the mechanism of delivery. They've made it smaller. They've made it tinier. That then allows the, uh, the, the frequency to be less. So you have less frequency, you have the less concentration, less side effects, increased safety profile, but getting the same type of outcomes that you did with the higher percentage of, of medications that are out there. Um, it's it's mucoadhesive, it's non-settling, uh, they call it a, sh a sheer uh, thinning type of gel, a gel in the bottle, but as soon as it hits the eye, it literally becomes you know, a, a, a solution or a liquid uh, that goes across the surface, becomes mucoadhesive, um, uh, and then is able to mix with the tears. And remember, it's a uniform dosing. You don't have to shake it because it's that gel, not suspension that's out there. And with that, there's non-blurring. So within that same category, you know, another load of prednol, why do we need another load of prednol? Well, Color Pharmacies back in August of 2018, um, you know, came up with Inveltis. Um, it's, you know, it's now uh, in distribution centers across, but they've used this amplified technology, right? So they really didn't do much with the mechanism of delivery. It's 1% that's out there, pretty strong steroid when you need it, but they're using that nanoparticular based mucus penetrating particles, right? I've been doing a lot of getting back to basics, a lot of science, looking back, back at the mitochondrials, all the organelles, the cell membrane, and mucus in our, in talking about the gut microbiome, the mucus on our eye, the mucus in our gut, very protective. So that's what it's there for, things that get stuck. And when you're trying to put medications that are trying to get you know a desired effect out there, um, the mucus, captures it, but mucus has holes in it. 
So that's why they call it nanoparticular side mucus penetrating particles. Make it small enough to get through that mucus that's out there. Again, more of a mechanism of delivery change. And it was for post-operative inflammation and cataract after cataract surgery. Um, and when it was the first cortical steroid to be BID. And again, remember, increase safety profile whenever you're using less medication. And then uh, Cala came out uh, in October 27th of 2020. Uh, we're a little bit past the year of when this was approved. But to me, this was good because this has now a medication that we all used a steroid for, dry eye, but there was never really a steroid out there that was approved for dry eye. We were all using it off label. I like when this happens because now we now have a medication just like the allergy uh, drop uh, came out, Alrex. We were all doing it, but at least now there's something in that category that has an indication. Doesn't mean you have to use it, but at least there's something in that category. And that's a th something I like here that happened with Isuvis is that it's the first medication for the short term or what they call the breakthroughs or the flares uh, of dry eye therapy. And you can use it up to two weeks. And what they've done here is taking that lotopredinol, okay, not really a mechanism of action, mechanism of delivery, made it small, wrapped it in that, that amplified technology, allowing it to get through that mucous membrane and to help with the, with the dry eye uh, patients that are out there. So as for the dry eye flares, yeah, it's that rapid onset inflammation driven uh, response to a variety of triggers that are out there, right? We hear about the interleukins and all the cytokines and chemokines that are out there that are part of that inflammatory uh, cycle. You know, some of it is that chronic burn that's out there when, when uh, receptors upregulate. And that's what, you know, Zydra taught us about those, those uh, lephitographs, you know, those uh, uh, receptors that upgrade on the cornea surface and then allowing more of the cytokines to interact and create, you know, that dry eye that's out there. So I did learn, you know, a lot from Tracy, you know, it's all about the receptors, you know, receptors being oxidatively damaged or stressed from chronic disease or the receptors are upregulating as a response to disease or the receptors are just, in a sense, turning off or downregulating. They become missing. So a lot of pharmacology is all about the receptors that's out there. So that's what Isuvis is. It's lodopredinol, quarter percent. Again, mechanism of delivery uh, that's out there. And we all know this because when you go, I just was at Seco and walking through the exhibit hall, big exhibit hall. And, you know, I just I didn't really do a, an analysis, but I would say, okay, over 50% of the exhibit hall is about dry eye, right? Mm -hmm. Novartis has this big thing, and we're talking about Quidel having their dry eye testing and so on. So lots of dry eye. We know that there's a lot of patients out there, and there's a lot that are have these breakthrough flares, you know, and I found this to be very useful uh, in my practice that's out there for these breakthroughs. The mechanism of action or really should be mechanism of delivery uh, is their amplified technology. That was one of the opening slides that I showed you where they literally took lodopredinol and they got the nano size to get through those mucus pores, right? So the particles are smaller. Those mucus pores in that when on the surface, if you look at them under you know, high magnification, they, they're about 500 nanometers. So you get that, that medication smaller, it goes through the tears, it's allowed to get through the mucus and penetrate into the tissues that you're trying to get this medication. And that's why it's that mucus penetrating type of technologies that's out there with these, with these companies. So again, spreads quicker, allows for penetration that's out there. So I'm gonna stay within the dry eye category and just talk about this one here, Tirvaya, and I've been actually playing around with it at my house here. I got a little bottle here, just playing around with it, seeing how I can help the patients out. And this one was recently approved, October 21st, 2020. It's a nasal spray. Nasal spray for dry eye, twice a day. You wanna put it in about approximately every 12 hours. 
one of the nice things marketing that's out there, if you want to say, is that it's preservative free. Uh, and we know, and I've been doing a lot, as Joe has pointed out, and I changed my bio, I've been doing a lot in nutrition, integrative medicine. We definitely an allopathic guy. I'm sitting here talking tonight about opposites curing. If it's inflamed, use an anti-inflammatory. But can we be doing something complementary to help these, these people and patients? And you can see here that we're talking about immune globulins is whenever we start getting that overexpression of, uh, of, of the inflammatory response. And then there's different mucins and, and electrolytes and proteins. So we have a normal tear film over here on the left side, and we kind of have this dysfunctional tear film over here on the right side. So basically, you know, adding tears was really cool when I graduated in 1995, but now understanding how complex the tears are with proteins, electrolytes, mucins, and immunoglobulins, and all the, all the components to this well-orchestrated, uh, you know, tear film, uh, you know, tears are great, but we probably should be doing something else for the patients. And, you know, when I lecture with Tracy, we'll, she'll say it all the time. There's nothing better than the natural source, right? If our food sources weren't so, you know, so crappy nowadays, like I just read an article that it takes 21 oranges uh, uh, of today from 1951 and the same thing someone sent me recently about spinach, you know, it's always best to get things from nature rather than synthetic that's out there. So there's no substitution for our natural tear. And that's why I'm kind of excited about this. I've got a few patients on it, um, maybe a little bit of some handling and trying to get it to their to the, to the right place and not to inhale uh, this medication. But the patients that I have on it with my, my N of say five to 10 coming back saying, hey, this is kind of cool. And what we're doing is with the, in a parasympathetic nervous system, basically stimulating the trigeminal nerve down here uh, in the just the lower part of the nose, you just put this nasal spray in here and you hit it with the medication. And it stimulates the trigeminal nerve. And then it really helps with the lacrimal, the lacrimal glands, the meibomian glands, the goblets, the, the goblet cells, and producing more tears. But it's producing everything, right? It's creating a stimulation. And so it's helping everything to kind of build up and uh, of, of the good stuff, not really the bad stuff to try and help these patients out. And really I found it, um, you know, like the Parkinson patient and the patient that has this kind of tough motor disorders, they're not all Parkinson's patients that have maybe a tough time putting drops in, but they seem to be able to get a nasal spray and get a pump on each side twice a day. So that's really where I found, you know, the sweet spot to be. I thought that this would potentially just kind of be like a niche type of medication, but it's gonna be neat to see how this unfolds. So you can see here, you're, you're inserting the, the spray into just the very tip and you don't have to inhale it, you just spray it. If the patient sneezes, which is one of the common side effects and they sneeze it out, the receptors have already been tickled. That's totally fine. They don't have to do another type of, uh, of stimulation or another type of installation uh, to the, uh, with the medication. But you can see here how it's all connected, basically gets back to the trigeminal nerve and then starts to go forward and start stimulating again the lacrimal gland, the meibomian glands and the goblet cells and helping to produce uh, the uh, the uh, the, the, all the layers, the complex parts to the tiers that are out there. So I just kept this slide in here. This is all about the receptors. You know, it, it has a high affinity for the alpha subunit in the cholinergic receptor located on the trigeminal nerve. Um, you know, again, when I lecture with Tracy, she's all about the, the receptor and how, uh, how the medications bind. And that's what uh, pharmacists do whenever they're trying to create a medication that's out there.
So a cholinergic agonist indicated for the treatment and signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. It was approved on October 15th, 2021. Uh, it's a one spray into each nostril and it's a spray. Let me tell you that you don't have to inhale it, right? It, it will do its work. So just a little insertion into the nasal cavity, usually for the left eye, right hand into the nose, pointing to the ear, squeeze, psh, get a spray, switch hands, left hand, right nostril, point towards the tip of the ear, psh, spray. And the only other uh, advice that I got from the MSL was to put the, 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 the tongue to the roof of the mouth. So tongue to the roof of the mouth, insert, spray, spray, and then let the, let the, the medication stimulate that trigeminal pathway that's out there. Joe, do you hey, have any Greg, comments on anything that I spoke of to this point? Well, actually, a question came uh, through to me directly, and it's a very good question, so I'm going to share it. And this is going back to the Lodiprednol, Lodimax uh, question. How often can you use any Lodimax or Lodiprednol for an iritis, and which one can you use every hour? Yeah, I'll... I'm sure you've answered, but I'll throw my mine out there. If I was going to try and treat an iritis um, first, you know, I definitely would use like atropine as if it's an iritis, but I know that's not the question, but I would also add the strongest low to prednol that's out there. You know, I think Inveltis is one of the strongest at 1%. Um, I would go every hour with it uh, to see if it would uh, control the, uh, uh, would control the iritis. And that may be probably safer in terms of steroid response. A patient uh, with known glaucoma, that's a consideration. But don't forget, we also have the, uh, the prednisolones and the diflopredinates, which are also very, very good uh, anti-inflammatories. Greg, uh, question came in. Why, uh, why put the tongue to the roof of the mouth? Yeah. Yeah. Um... That was a question that I had uh, to the MSL. And basically it is uh, the one to help prevent any uh, like medication getting down. And once you spray it, get, you know, going down into the, uh, getting deep into the nasal cavity. So you don't inhale, right? So if you put your um, tongue to the roof of your mouth, it's hard to inhale because a lot of people they're used to maybe like an Afrin type of spray or inhalers and they want to, and, you know, they want to inhale it naturally. So basically to try and stop the inhalation side of that. Is there any taste to it, Greg? Um, I've tried it a couple of times. I haven't had any taste to it. Um, I had sneezed a couple of times. I've heard that. Uh, um, but I probably, in, in, you know, probably tried it 10, 15 times, uh, maybe sneezed twice. But uh, it does, you know, after maybe five minutes, I have to go blow my nose. It does create a little stimulation to the nose. And just a, a comment from me uh, to the audience. I launched two handouts. Uh, this is it's the same material. One is six sides to sides to a page. The other is uh, full slides uh, you can download. And the update to that is I sent those slides to our uh, IT department on Wednesday or Thursday, and I did add some slides like this. What I just talked about. I think the Tiravaya wasn't in there. If you guys want it, I can burn these into PDFs and send it to you. Just email me at greg at optometricedu.com. So it is updated from uh, Wednesday because these lots of stuff that's out there that's happening. Anything else, Joe? No. Okay. So here's, um, you know, I have pharmaceutical update question mark and I have Regenerize in here. And uh, you know, I've been doing a lot the last five years uh, trying to, do some, patients are expecting it now, right? Some naturopathic ways. And, you know, Regenerize, I've really been taking a deep dive into this, using this in the office. You know, this is, you know, not really traditional pharmacy, right? There we're kind of using placenta derived as we go through the slides here, a cellular solution and targeting those cytokines that we always hear, but in a natural way. 
vital tears, drawing some blood, spinning out the plasma, turning it in natural way. So if you're doing things like omega threes, EPA, DHA, if you're using vitamin supplementation to some extent in your practice to maybe treat macular degeneration, uh, if you're using amniotic membranes, vital tears, you're already doing integrative optometry out there. It's not that true allopathic way where opposites cure. Uh, you just kind of didn't realize that you were doing it until someone points it out. And this is just another way of doing it. It's been fun working with this company. I have two patients that are responded great on it. They'll turn into cases. I had a patient that had a dupixin. He's going to end up in my couple of my lectures. I have a lecture of where it's uh, complications from, uh, from medications, systemic and co ocular complications. He's taken Dupixit and comes in and has the conjunctivitis from it, but he's loving how his psoriatic arthritis, boy, do I give him a steroid uh, uh, that's out there? He's already using something that's immunocompromised. Uh, so I tried the uh, Regenerize Pro and he just texted me the other day saying I was able to wear my contacts, pretty cool. Um, I had another patient that had just some neurotrophic keratitis, um, wanted to try something more naturopathic and so suggested this. And she just texted me the other day and said, you know, hey, it burns when I put it in. I said, great, forgot to tell you. Oops, my fault. It will burn because it's a high concentration, but um, not hurting your eye. Uh, but she said that her eye was feeling better. So let's, you know, question mark. Is it pharmacology? Does it belong in the update? So let's just touch about it real quick because I've been getting a lot of questions that's out there. So just know that there's a Regenerize uh, Light and then there's Regenerize Professional Strength that's out there. So the, the, the professional strength obviously is formulated for the severe symptoms and stealing one to four drops a day. I'm gonna tell you, they're not really big bottles that's out there. And then the Regenerize Light, uh, I removed them, I had some sent to my house, uh, formulated for mild to moderate symptoms, one to four drops a day that's out there. Now let's go through real quick. If you'll see here, it's first in its class, it's natural, it's a sterile biologic ophthalmic solution, it's preservative free. And again, look, we're targeting those cytokines. Interleukin-1 is the big one that's out there, right? When you want, if you were taking a test, if I was taking a test and they were asking about any of the interleukins, interleukin-1 is the bad one. That's the one that kind of sparks. There's good ones, there's pro-inflammatory, and there's ones that are anti-inflammatory. The pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, would be interleukin-1. Chemokines and growth factors that are out there. And this is kind of cool. This is, you're hearing a lot of this, the derived, multiple uh, allergenic protein paracrine signaling. Basically, what does that mean? Getting back to, again to immunology and cells, that's the cells talking to each other. That'd be like, hey, Joe, give me a hand here. You know, I'm walking on some ice. I didn't realize it. And uh, you're walking on pavement. Can you help me out? So that would be like, Joe, just grab my arm and let me get me off this ice. That would be like two cells kind of talking paracrine signaling that's out there. Um, so again, it goes back to where are these medications working, uh, whether it's pharmaceuticals or natural, where are they working, what level? Here it's in para, uh, para, paracrine signaling, talking back and forth, rather maybe than receptors. Maybe that will help clear it up a little bit. So it's, you know, the potential therapeutic treatment is really focused on the dry eye side of this, the dryness, the grittiness, the soreness, the irritation. But again, it's a naturopathic way of going after this that's out there. Regenerize is acellular. It contains proteins and cytokines. Now cytokines get a bad rap at times, right? Cytokines, wow, interleukin one. Remember, there are good cytokines. You can't paint them all in a bad way. There's anti-inflammatory, there's pro-inflammatory that are out there. So obviously we're filtering out the proteins that are good, the cytokines that are good, uh, in addition to some water glucose. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's bioactive fluid. It has lipids, proteins, cytokines, chemokines, and all the, the, the fun uh, anti-inflammatories that are out there. So it does follow uh, the current good practices out there. The, the, uh, the CGMP, current good pract uh, manufacturing practices, 
Uh, and again, there's all kinds. We can remember it's not regulated by the FDA, right? It's kind of like our vitamins and they have these good manufacturing uh, practices that are out there. So here it is, uh, molecular mechanisms going after that interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. We, when that interleukin receptor gets hit with interleukin-1, then bad things happen. That's pro-inflammatory. What we're doing here is working against that. Uh, it's making it an antagonist to that receptor in a sense down, regulating it. But you can see also it's working on tumor necro uh, necrosis factor alpha. You know, those are all just bad uh, parts of that pro-inflammatory that's out there. So uh, molecular proteins like the FABP protein, uh, it's working there. We're talking about the PF4 that's out there. And it's indicated in the sense on the dry eye side. It also has some meibomian gland uh, positive outcomes that out there. Just started playing around with it. I'm liking it. Um, like I said, you heard me say I'm doing some natural ways. Patients are expecting it. They don't always want uh, to be using something that maybe is a, a pharmaceutical derived. And so you can see here the eye drop again, interleukin one, the antagonist. We're talking about tumor necrosis factor and all the different uh, outcomes and different types of molecules that are in this, in this, in a sense, naturopathic drop. And there it is with the meibomian gland side of it, working on the morphology uh, that's out there. So if you're looking for something more naturopathic, there's something there for you. Again, Sjogren's patients, approximately one out of 10 suffer from dry eye, maybe the professional strength on the Sjogren's patient, because I deal a lot with uh, the Sjogren's patients that are out there. So again, just as a conclusion, if you're looking for some type of immunosuppressive, regenerative properties, a natural way of doing it, take a look and check it out and see if it fits into your practice. And there are lots of references. I knew I'd get lots of questions, so I just threw the references in there. It will be in the handout. Hey, Greg, a question came in. Is it prescription only? And can you use this in combination with Restasis or Zydra? Yeah, great question. Uh, that's an awesome question. And so it is not prescription. Remember, this is naturopathic, right? So not a prescription. You can order these for your uh, in your office uh, and you can sell them out of your office or you can order them right to the company and the company will take care of it uh, for you. I like keeping them in the office. The professional um, doesn't have to be uh, refrigerated. Uh, until opened, but I have a, I have with all these different medications, I have a pharmaceutical fridge at the office, so I do keep the professional in there. I do keep the uh, the light in there, but the light once doesn't have to be stored that way. Um, it it once in the, and the light doesn't once it's open doesn't need to be stored in a refrigerator. Just the professional uh, does. But uh, can it be used with Zydra and Restasis? Absolutely, right? And there you go, guys. That's your integrative optometry, right? When you take something uh, like uh, 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 someone that's getting VEGF injections and you add on like a full retina vitamin, that's complementing, that's integrating, that's out there. So yeah, if you're using uh, Zydra and Restasis, that's your pharma side, right? That's the opposite cure. Now we're using something naturopathic. That would be you doing something integrative that's out there. I just probably wouldn't put them in at the same time because a lot of these biologics are complex, sensitive, and you don't really want maybe the chemical from the restasis or the Zydra or vice versa to interfere with each other, maybe about an hour or two hours apart to allow them to do what they're supposed to do. Anything else, Joe? Nope. Uh, let me just double check here. No, nope, I think you got all of those. Okay. All right. So this one uh, is new to the handout. Uh, I was remember this one uh, popping into my head. So I was like, oh, we better talk about it. ActiView, uh, basically adding in some Zatator or Aloe. So just it's a contact lens, the first and only medication releasing contact lens for patients who need uh, correction and relief uh, from their itchy eyes. Uh, it's, it's built right into the contact lens. It's been shown to have up to 12 hours of 
of, and I see I didn't get the reference put on there. So, oops, sorry, but it's reference 12 hours of uh, uh, lasting relief. Uh, at the Filicon A is the, uh, uh, is, the, is the contact lens material. Again, you can see uh, Zadator Alloway with keto tiffin, keto tiffin uh, that's being used, which we know is uh, a great or known to be a good uh, antihistamine blocking the receptors on the, uh, hist on the mast cell, stabilizing that mast cell membrane, inhibiting the inflammatory cells from accumulation. So basically getting onto the receptor of the mast cell stabilizing the mast cell, not allowing all the, remember those pro-inflammatory, uh, one being histamine, and then there's a whole other litany of, of uh, cells and, and cytokines that get leaked out of that mast cell, which then creates that whole signaling response that's out there. So that's what uh, this antihistamine does. You can see the parameters, it's an 8.5 base curve, 14.2 diameter, and you can see the ranges in the quarter steps and the half steps that's out there. So kind of neat that a contact lens has made a pharmacology update uh, lecture that's out there. All right, let's talk about glaucoma here. So in glaucoma, oh, we got a polling question. Let's see, let me launch it here. I got it, Joe. Okay. All right, so just wanna know, have you used natarsidil uh, out there with natarsidil? Uh, in, in Ropressa, Roclitan uh, for the treatment of glaucoma. Yes, no, you don't treat glaucoma or you'll put a comment in the chat box. All right, let's see, did I get all these? Any taste, we got that. Regenerized prescription only. Yeah, we talked about it's from nature. It's a placenta derived. They have a whole pro proprietary process. You could talk to their MSLs about that, if not equivalent to the MSL, but to their scientists. All right. Going to share the results. Okay. We have about 20% that have used it, uh, about 60% that haven't, and 20% that don't treat glaucoma. And we'll see if someone puts a comment in the chat box. So with that being said, let's talk about Ropressa. Um, the glaucoma market really got boring there for a while. My first lecture that I did as a resident um, was Latanoprost, prostaglandin uh, analog Zalatan. And that was uh, my first lecture that I did. And I found uh, it on my CV the other day. And sometimes I put it in here. Um, but really, since then, there really wasn't any new novel glaucoma drugs that came out. They were all kind of me too drugs. Azopt was a carbonic anhydrase used, a, a car, uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor used uh, systemically, formulated into an eye drop. Same thing with alpha GAN, and then combining beta blockers and so on and so forth. Really, nothing new came along. Uh, until Ropressa, meaning a whole new novel. I hate using that with the coronavirus out there, the novel coronavirus. This is the novel Natarsidil product. It was a 2017 to, to treat glaucoma and ocular hypertension. And it was, it's a Rho kinase inhibitor. They called it the, RET, the rock net inhibitor. It was a whole new novel way of treating glaucoma uh, that is used once a day, twice a day, was not tolerated well. It does create hyperemia, it does create verticillata, it does create some conjunctival vasal dilation or, uh, uh, or what they call uh, hemorrhage. So again, the, the Ropressa is going after the disease where glaucoma is. Glaucoma is a disease of outflow. We're seeing that all the new uh, MIGS procedures the, uh, bypassing the, the situs skeletal changes that have occurred to the trabecular meshwork, right? They, 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 they become stiffened and the flow, it can't just, you can't get the aqueous into Schlem's canal to a collector channel to the episcleral venous veins. And then Joe, is that, does it go to the uh, cavernous sinus? I always forget where it goes after that. Episcleral venous to where? 
Well, it goes from episclerovenous to the uh, superior and inferior abdominic veins into the cavernous sinus and out for, through the inferior, inferior petrosal sinus to the jugular vein. Thank you for uh, phoning a friend on that one. And that's oh, why if we get a, a cavernous sinus fistula, we could see blood in Schlem's canal. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's actually a, a very important uh, pearl when you think you might see a fistula put a gonial lens on. And if you're not pushing too hard, which is really kind of hard to do, if you're not pushing too hard and you see blood in Schlem's canal, you know, you've kind of got your, uh, your diagnosis. So again, going back to glaucoma, this is a disease of the trabecular meshwork. The cytoskeletal has changed, cytoskeleton has changed, and uh, Repressa starts to work on the actin and myosin and really uh, expanding. So here's the trabecular meshwork. So down here where my pointer is, this would be the anterior chamber. Trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal. What's not in this in this slide would be a collector channel. Somewhere along this wall, eventually a collector channel, again, out to the episcleral, the superior orbital vein, and then into the cavernous sinus. And so we're trying to get that aqueous through, but you can see what has happened when you use natarsidil, it expands it, uh, this trabecular meshwork. Uh, so I found that uh, this really works well uh, on lowering a low IOP. And you can see here, you know, we know that when a pressure is high, 28, you might put a prostaglandin analog and get it to 18, a 10 point drop. You know, with this medication, you can just consistently, when it works, consistently get about a four or five millimeter drop. If you're at 28, you're not going to be blown away. You're going to go down about 523. But if you're at a 16 and you go down to an 11, that's pretty impressive. So where I found this drop, Natarsidil, uh, Repressa to work really, really well is lowering a low IOP because it's got a couple different mechanism of action. It actually lowers the pressure in the episcleral venous system. I'm thinking that's why we see all the conjunctival hyperemia. It's creating that vasodilation. It's been shown that it's the only medication out there to lower on the episcleral side. That's why our pressure can only get so low because there's pressure in that cavernous sinus, that superior orbital vein that gets into the episcleral veins, which then gets into the canal. So you can only get it as low as that system. But if we can lower a little bit there, expand that trabecular meshwork, we can lower the IOP that's out there. There's no label contraindications that's out there. It was tested in an inferiority against uh, Timolol. Timolol did it was supposed to do. It changed the blood pressure. It changed the heart rate. But Ropressa has nothing to do with those receptors. So it really didn't do anything on that side. So here is the conjunctival hemorrhages. It's more of a conjunctival vasodilation that I see that's out there. Uh, you, here's the verticillata that can occur. And this is from their slides. This is their slide deck. And it's the same verticillata, this phospholipidosis that you get with amiodarone. So what I was expecting, and this was my uh, an LOL moment, I tell this story a lot, is that I had this patient come in and you could see that this patient had all this kind of this, I thought Fabre's and like, oh, I got my Fabre disease here. I don't blah, blah, blah. What the heck's all this brown stuff? Here's the other eye. I was only using the Tarsidil in one eye. I thought that the pattern was going to be as classic as amiodarone. It's the same pathophysiology, phospholipidosis, but this is a systemic administration so it's kind of coming in through the epithelial cells. This is kind of the healing pattern of the epithelial cells. This one here is a topical administration. This you can see real close. If you follow the lines, you can see the type of pigmentation. This is the verticillata that they're talking about. The other eye didn't have it because I was only using it as a monocular uh, for this patient. So the verticillata does occur, but it's not going to be that classic type of whirl-like pattern that you see. So again, the common side effects are the hyperemia, uh, the cornea verticillata, the conjunctival hemorrhages that are out there. And then I was um, a part of OGS, 
Uh, Joe's, I believe, one of the founders of OGS. I was able to get in a few years later. Uh, but the Optometric Glaucoma Society, there's a little web, a little Google, and Charles McBride shared this, and I asked him if I could share it, and he was showing the the uh, the honeycomb epithelial edema that can happen. But it's really with these patients that have really sick eyes. Uh, when I was talking to the medical science liaison, they really don't see it in a in a, in a sense, you know, if you want to say a normal glaucoma this eye. This one, as you could see here, was blind, and they thought it was pretty much from neovascular glaucoma. So it's really the compromised eyes that you're getting this. And Joe Shovelin, a past president of the, the uh, American Academy of Optometry, good, good friend, uh, super smart guy, is always helping me with this. And he shared his honeycomb epithelial edema associated. So I have to give the thanks to Joe Shovelin uh, showing me uh, his rope, uh, his natarsidil honeycomb epithelial edema that can occur. So then Ari came out in March 14 of 2019. Again, now this is pretty cool. It's the first PGA to be a combo with something that actually lowers an IOP at a pretty consistent rate. So I've been getting a lot of good uh, results with this. And this is really the first PGA combination and really that's because it's superiority over inferiority. And I don't want to spend too much time because I got a lot of stuff to cover here. But when you go with a single agent like Natarsidil or Ropressa or Azopt or any of the single agents, Alphagan, it just has to be equal or better than Timolol. When you do a combo, it's tough. It's tough to bring combos to the market. And so it has to be superior to both products. So they tested against Rocklatan. They tested this one against Ropressa. And all the time points, it has to be superior. That's why you don't see a, a, Rocklet, a, 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 a prostaglandin Timolol combination because we know that there's no beta activity in the evening. So it might meet, but it doesn't be superior and that's why other countries have a prostaglandin timolol, and we can't get it here because it's not superior overall, overall points. So that is good if you're, you know, concerned about cost or trying to get um, a patient to be more compliant. The pharmacies want to bust them into two bottles. I'm trying to keep them into one bottle because the more bottles and more drops, the less likely the patient's going to be compliant. So, you know, that's why the combinations are out there. Um, so that is, you know, Rock Latan, the first PGA combination. You know, it's stored in the refrigerator. It's okay uh, once you open it and it might be getting a new cap uh, bottle uh, in, the, in the future, a new color. So Darista came out. It is basically uh, uh, Lumigan 0.03%. And I was going to turn this into a polling question, but I'll just let everyone know here is that it's literally one drop of 0.03% that is put into this implant. And it's been shown that it can last anywhere from three months to 12 months. And the biodegradable material is not as biodegradable in everyone as they thought it was going to be. And that's why the that's why the FDA only approved it for once. If you see it being approved used twice, it's just the person that's injecting it using it off label. We do off label all the time uh, with medications like treating a central corneal ulcer with a fluoroquinolone. It's only approved for bacterial conjunctivitis. So if you see that, it's not anything wrong. It's just that Allergan or slash AbV cannot talk about it. Um, because it would be off label, the MSL person would be able to talk about what's happening and keeping track of those docs that are using it two or three times. But that's really, um, I just sat in a KOL meeting uh, just last week when I was at SECO. And basically, it's not a dead product. They're still pouring a lot of science and research into it. So just be aware that's out there. Hey, if a patient is having a tough time getting their drops in, and you want to at least maybe get three to 10 months or a year out of it, you don't know how it's going to work, refer to someone that's doing it uh, and might help that person out. And maybe they can get a second administration 
uh, if you put a Ghania lens on there and see that the material has, uh, has, has totally gone away. So that's going to be kind of be the future of medications that are out there. Uh, so that's Durista, that's by the by Matapros, which is Lumigan uh, implant. Joe, I know you do a lot of glaucoma while this is going on, and I run this polling question. Um, do you have any comments on any of the products that I just talked about? Yeah, a few, a few comments. Um, the Durista. You know, Durista is really easy to sell when they're undergoing cataract surgery because they, they don't know, uh, you know, they don't really feel anything different. But, you know, doing an in-office procedure is a little harder to sell. Patients generally don't go for that. You know, it, it doesn't always sit in the, uh, in the, in the lower angle. In fact, uh, you know, I, I see Durista, you know, adhering to the surface of the mid peripheral iris. You know, the pa and patients can see that. I think one of the challenges is when, when this gets used and nobody actually has the forethought to take them off the prostaglandin to see what actually happens. So sometimes it's done and we don't actually know what happens or how well it works because you know, nobody, nobody has a forethought to uh, you know, stop the latanoprost. And talking about Roclitan and Ropressa, you know, interesting Ropressa, it barely got, got approved. It, you know, it, it had to go through a couple of tries. It barely got approved but it has outperformed the clinical trials. And you know, for a while, Ropressa was a necessary evil because the company and the practitioners all wanted Roclitan, that great combination agent. And really, Ropressa has dominated that market. Uh, I don't see much in terms of Roclitan, much, uh, much support, promotion, or even use, but I do see quite a bit of uh, Ropressa. Yeah, I think is why you see that is one, I think formula coverage, and then two, um, you know, latanoprost is generic, and now you can get Ropressa, it's on a lot of formularies, you kind of got it that way. Um, and then whenever you want to put it into one bottle, then there's not a lot of good formulary coverage out there. But I know it's changing in my area. But uh, yeah, I agree, it barely got approved. That's a good point. And uh, now it's, uh, you know, like you said, dominating. So yeah, good comments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another one that I thought of is that, you know, we kind of think about, you know, we talk about all the pharmacology and the percentage and mechanism of delivery, mechanism of action. Think about what the wrist does. We get one drop in the anterior chamber. If we get the medication to where the disease is, the trabecular meshwork, you only need one drop, 0.03%, and it lasts anywhere from three to 12 months or longer. Uh, so again, you can see how, you know, complicated that ocular surface is when you're putting in drops every day and why you have to put it in every day. So if we can get the medication to the disease, um, that's always seems to be the best. So. And, what, and one thing I've seen with Ropressa in my area, and this is also speaking about uh, glaucoma surgeons, is it's, it's being used thrown in sort of as part of the armamentarium late in the disease uh, when they don't want to do surgery. You know, it, it, I, I, I've seen it almost as an end stage, uh, end stage drug. Yeah. And a patient with poor compliance, right? Mm -hmm. So polling question three, did Combigan go generic? Uh, yes, 50%, no, 25%, 25% say they don't treat glaucoma. And then, uh, Patty, congratulations on the uh, glaucoma uh, in Massachusetts. That's awesome uh, out there. So, um, you know, congrats. And uh, now we can treat patients at the highest level, right? All righty. So, all right. So, when is uh, uh, Combigan supposed to go generic? Well, Supposed to go generic right here. It says April 19th of 2022. This is a screenshot from Pharma Compass. Um, I've, I've, I knew this year it was going to go generic and it was kind of funny. This is a story, uh, a great story in a sense. Too bad the patients weren't reversed. I had a chuck run down the, the hallway, literally tackling the patient, not tackling them, but makes for a good story as they're walking out the door. I, I go in on a Monday, I see a patient and the patient goes, hey man, I'm paying you know, 129 or 120 for a three months supply of this. Come again, is there any chance that it's gone generic? And I get on to this pharma company. I said, oh, good news is look, April 19th. And um, 
he's yeah, he's like, okay, great. By the end of the year, maybe we can switch over. I said, sure, I'll try. And as long as it works, I don't have any problem doing it. But you know, sometimes the generics are not as good and blah, blah, blah. We'll just, you know, oh, keep an open mind about it. We'll do it for sure. If it works, then we, we stay with it, so on and so forth. So I go into the next room and this patient says, hey, doc, check this out. Is it okay to use this? I'm like, uh, bromonidine tartrate. I'm like, wait, this is Comigan. It's the same percentages. I look at the drops and then I go over here and I look it's distributed by, by Allergan. I said, hold on, I'll be back. Right, running down the hallway to the first patient, I just wish they would have been reversed because I would have looked like a genius uh, going going from this patient to the next patient. Oh, yeah, you know, not till April 19th that it's supposed to be. But look, I know that this is an early release, for lack of a better term. Um, but you can see here that it, these were taken on February 21st, whenever I was in the clinic, that Combigan has gone generic. Now, maybe Allergan is not going out and promoting it because, you know, still there, they have their flagship Comigan that's out there, but it's not uncommon for basically like Zalatan, when it lost its uh, uh, patent, they basically convert the lines over to generic and based, you know, and one of the lines is, uh, um, is, uh, is the Zalatan. And they basically put the same medication and one is Alatan and one was, I forget what they call it, like green, green something pharmacy. Um, you can see here that it's not called AbV or it's not called Allergan, but it's this, uh, look what it is, Apotex Corporation. But you can see it's 2021, it's an Allergan distributed uh, out of Florida, a product of the United States here. So there's your combinate, there's your Combigan. Uh, that's already out there uh, ahead of when the patent runs out being made in a sense by an Allergan type of pharmacy. So I was at Seco, as you hear me mentioning, and this is from the Santan. Uh, they had a, a display there, Santan, I guess, Santan, S-A-N-T-E-N, or is it S-A-N-T-A-N? Uh, but uh, T -E -N, T -E -N. is it T-E-N? Yeah. Yep, there it is right here at the bottom, T-E-N. And so I was talking to the medical science liaison. They got some pretty exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, they have this, they have two, in a sense, prostaglandin. They have two uh, glaucoma drops for ocular hypertension. This one's approved. And I always need Tracy for the omidipag isopropyl. I was butchered the names up. But you can see it's gone through phase one, two, three. It's already gone through the filing and it's in a sense approved where the issue is right now. They're not liking how the bottle is performing. The FDA is not liking how the bottle is performing. They like how the drug is performing, but not the bottle. Uh, so we're hopefully you could see here in Japan, in Asia, it's approved and already out there. We've already gone through the US through all the steps. Uh, it's not formally approved yet. It has to, it's not really because of the drug, it's because of the bottle. So that's going to be kind of neat. Let's keep an eye out on for that. And then here's another prostaglandin analog uh, that's, uh, and both of these are in a sense from talking to the MSL, you're not going to get the orbital fat, the orbital sinking uh, that occurs with the other prostaglandins. So they've targeted so you don't get the side effects that's out there. So stay tuned. And then you see this one here, cyclosporin uh, that's approved for uh, vernal ker keratoconjunctivitis. So this was a child that I saw years ago. I don't see that many children. He came in, mom says rubbing his eyes all the time. You know, so I take a look, he's got a little bit of injection, nothing really crazy here. But if I lift his upper lid, you could see he's got these Trantis Horner dots, right? Late phase, eosinophil buildup, cytokines, all the different types of medication, all those different types of signaling molecules have called in the white blood cells. This is probably going to be IgE here uh, as part of the Im immunoglobulin response. You can see he's a little bit red here. Uh, and then when I flipped his eyelid, you can definitely see the response that's going on underneath his eyelid. So this is VKC, uh, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, and this is approved as of June last year by SAN10. Thanks, Joe, for the, for the assist again. But it has just not been released yet. It's supposed to be coming this month or next month, and it's going to be 
Uh, basically, cyclosporin emulsion, 0.1%. So if you remember, uh, restasis is 0.05, and then we got 0.9 as sun, and now we got 0.1%. The issue with cyclosporin, it's a great drop if you can get it to the tissue. The problem is it's a fat molecule, right? And when you drop it into aqueous, it doesn't penetrate. It's kind of like uh, Valtrex or even acyclovir, 800 milligrams, five times a day, horse pill, five times a day, compared to Synthroid, you know, micro uh, micrograms, not grams, but micrograms versus 800 milligrams. So it doesn't penetrate real well. So that's why you're seeing the concentrations go up. And now they're changing the mechanism of delivery, right? They've got this, this, whatever they're calling it, no vas orb, no vas orb technology. Again, they put the fat loving molecule, wrap it in a surfactant. You have these catatonic agents. You got an oily, so basically it's like a capsule. You drop it into the into the tears. It's able to na navigate that fat molecule. Is able to navigate through the tear film, and then it breaks apart. But now the fat molecule is by the cornea, which is can absorb fatty tissues or fatty molecules and allowed to be absorbed. So it's called uh, vacasia. Uh, Vercasia, and it's going to be used for VK, uh, for VKC, but I'm kind of wondering if this is going to be good for some dry eye patients, because I was never a big fan of cyclosporin. If I did use it, I would tell them just use the vial, set it twice a day, all day long, trying to push it through and get it to the cornea and get that result. If we can get it to the tissue, so hopefully the higher concentration here and then the change in the mechanism of delivery will help us out. So again, it's indicated for the treatment, children to adults of VKC, uh, vernal keratoconjunctivitis. conjunctivitis. The dosage is one drop four times daily. Again, see, it's just hard to get that medication there. It's an emulsion, so the drop should be milky white. Uh, you discard, it's gonna be single dose vials. Um, I really don't know if they're going to have to use one dot of uh, four vials a day. It's going to be recapable. Just stay tuned uh, out there. But I just wanted to bring an attention that Santen, you know, has this medication and then maybe some glaucoma medications coming in the future that's out there. And you can see here how we're getting into that, uh, into that pro-inflammatory, those cytokines. Right. So whenever you you have we're talking about T cells here, getting down to that kind of that T helper cell. And here's one right here. Look, pro-inflammatory. There's an interleukin. There's that cytokine again, probably cytokine one activated and brought over the T cell helper cell and it created the T helper cell. If you remember all that immunology, uh, it was a recruiting and now we're getting T2 and now T2 uh, is now activated in that pro-inflammatory response. So if we can block this right here, this activation of the T cell uh, with this medication, um, and, and that's what cyclosporin, and that's basically how cyclosporin works. All right, let's get into the alpha adrenergic receptors that are out there. And there's a whole bunch. We have Iopidine, we have Alphagam, Lumify, Nafcon A, Visine, Upneak, uh, Oxymetazoline, uh, Hydrochloride Nasal Spray, right? That's what we knew it as uh, one time, uh, as I think, uh, as Afrin. We have, we have it as over-the-counter eye drops, as low as 0.25%. We've got it as prescription topical creams, 1% for rosacea. So again, this is, again, when we talk about L, uh, adrenergic uh, alpha receptor agonists, uh, there's a whole bunch. And I guess, yeah, iopidine here works on a different receptor. And, you know, Joe talks very uh, well, uh, eloquently about how we can use that for horners, but we can't really use alpha gam because they're different receptors that are out there. So if you're going to test for horners, you want to use iopidine and really not alpha gam, but they both lower IOP. But think about Lumify. Lumify does nothing to the pupil, but gets rid of redness. Then we have Upneak, raises the eyelid, doesn't really do anything to the pupil size. 
These are all alpha agonists, different molecules targeting different receptors, having higher affinities for different receptors that are out there. So polling question number four now is just curious. It's been out for a little bit. Have you used Upneak in your practice on your patients? Yes, no, or I'll put a comment in the, in the chat box. You know, interestingly, Greg, uh, in the state of Florida, I, I, I can't comment for other states. Uh, I don't know the, all the rules, but you can be a dispensing, far, uh, dispensing practitioner. You can sell drugs for profit out of your office if you register with the Department of Health, and it's not very expensive to do that. And more optometrists in Florida, and it's not a lot, but more are actually doing this because of Upneak. Yep. And you're going to be seeing more and more of that happening mm -hmm. uh, with these medications. Um, I just sat whenever I was at SECO and a couple advisory boards. And so just so everyone knows out there, it's not that I don't want to disclose information, but a lot of times we have to sign these non-disclosure agreements. Um, but, you know, you're going to be seeing more and more uh, medications like that. And so, Joe, you're right. In Pennsylvania, it's kind of gray. We're trying to figure out, uh, can we do it as optometrists and not violate our optometric practice act, or even the pharmaceutical uh, practice act, there might be something in there. So the uh, you know I, I'm gonna I'm going to strongly you know advise anybody who's considering doing this, please uh, check with your state board first so you don't run afoul of anything. And somebody just asked a question: Does our camera have to be on to get CE? The answer is no. So the thanks, Joe, for handling that. Um, mm -hmm. I have used Upneak. Uh, the results are about 35% yes and 65% uh, no. So, you know, basically Upneak, oxymetazoline, hydrochloric solution and alpha agonist uh, was uh, approved on July 9, 2020. Uh, indication for non-surgical treatment for acquired blephrotosis. You know, probably the biggest thing that I want to point out, and we're going to talk, you know, Joe's big into neuro. Joe has certainly made me a lot better in neuro, just hanging out with him and being a phone a friend and listening to his lectures is that probably the biggest thing that I'd want to make sure that a patient coming in with ptosis, make sure they don't have a Horner syndrome. Uh, and then just make sure it's acquired, you know, from the levator disinsertion that's out there. Uh, it's a preservative free, uh, balanced salt solution. Uh, and yeah, I talking to Tracy, anytime there's a alpha Tracy is the pharmacist that I lecture with anytime it's an alpha agonist coming from the root or the reference molecule, in a sense, if you want to say back in the day from systemic, this just gets tagged on, right? So the alpha ergic agonist is a class that may impact blood pressure, uh, orthostatic hypotension, so on and so forth. You know, my opinion, it's a drop. You got to be be careful of these, beware of these, but it's an eye drop. This gets tagged on from all the systemic uh, complications that are out there. So the adverse reactions, one to 5% of the subjects treated with apneic were punctate keratitis, conjunctival hyperemia, you know, installation on pain. Again, that's just, you know, the pH is different. The eye is going to burn. It's an alpha adrenergic agonist as a class. Um, it may impact blood pressure. Again, it goes back to that. So, you know, just be aware of that. Um, how does it work? The oxymetazoline in Upneak has a five to one affinity for the alpha two receptors that are out there. So alpha two, that's what's in the Mueller muscle. And then that's what gets stimulated and then raises, uh, the, raises the eyelid. So the dosing is one drop administered in the totic eye or eyes. Um, I've had friends and uh, patients that have had retinal detachment surgery. They get a droopy eyelid and they use it just in the one eye. So that's why it'd be totic eye, but be careful in that monocular patient that they don't have a Horner's uh, syndrome. Um, used once daily, you know, I have no problem telling the patient at the end of the day, if it's wearing off, save the bottle, put the other one in, use the rest of it, or, uh, so I have no problem with them using it uh, outside of the 
uh, FDA approved one drop administered once a day. They can use it twice a day if they want to open up another bottle. Um, and it's that marginal reflex distance. So if you're looking at my, my uh, me in the camera and you see the light hitting my, my cornea, that would be the marginal reflex distance from the where the light hits my cornea up to the lid margin. That's marginal reflex one going to the upper lid. Marginal reflex two is going uh, to the lower lid. You can see the peak effect is in one hour, last eight hours again. So I have no problem having the uh, patient use it more than uh, more than once. Um, I have a lot of patients that are super happy with it. Uh, what I usually do is I, if I see the ptosis as in these patients here, um, I put it in one eye. I show them how the one eye goes up. You can see that there's the lid fold is missing. There's a disinsertion of the levator here. And you wouldn't think that this patient was super excited, but they're still using it to this day. Uh, this person was super excited. Look how much she went from here to here uh, in raising her eyelid. This patient came in and she's like, hey, look, everyone always thinks I'm super sleepy. I said, well, I could see where that's coming from. And we put the upneak in and she was really excited. So I have a lot of patients that are out there. I try to look for these patients when they come in and put again, put it in one eye, show them the imbalance, and then obviously uh, put the drop in the other eye before they leave so that they can have them both raised up. And that's kind of how I do it. Uh, Greg, here, here's a question that's came through. Any use in myasthenia gravis? Um, I'll let you go with that one, Joe. I, I mean, in the lid, I guess maybe that would be the question in the, in the lid droop. Is that what they're mm -hmm. asking? Yes. Yeah, I, it would stimulate the, the alpha-2 receptor because remember, myasthenia gravis, it's an acetylcholinase, right? It attacks the receptor. It's a true receptor. Antibodies attacking the receptor. So could you use it? Sure, it's going to stimulate. It's not going to uh, it's not going to go in and help the acetylcholine build up to a, a high level to go and uh, hit those receptors and get the patient going again. Uh, so it would stimulate. So if the patient has ptosis from myasthenia gravis, um, it would work. But it, you know, myasthenia gravis is so variable. But Joe, I'll let you give your comments. Yeah, and and the pathophysiology behind myasthenia gravis and the uh, the receptor blockage. Yeah, it could help a little bit, but it's not going to be very impressive. It's it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be like using a mestinon. Uh, it's you know, it's it's not really going to do much for it. And, and and I'm going to head off another question, because I actually have used this in Horner syndrome, and it's very unimpressive in Horner syndrome. In fact, for Horner syndrome, I just generally prescribe uh, half percent iapidine, and that works really well for patients. I tried this and the, the duration of action was, uh, was actually very low. Question came in also, Greg, uh, do you always travel in office before you prescribe it? Um, the answer is because it says always no. I've had patients call me and say, hey, I saw an advertisement, can I try it? Um, and I have no problem doing it that way. I have some trial, I have samples that they can come in and pick up. Do I always no? Do most of the time, yes. Yeah, I don't always do it in office. You know, the the rep, you know, suggested, hey, put a put a drop in, you know, while they're dilating. You know, they can see how it works. I don't do that. I don't think I've ever done that. But I give out samples. In fact, you know, we 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 give out samples of Upneak like they're Mar Mardi Gras be beads. <laughs> yeah, with all the snowbirds and the population that you have, and mm -hmm. and I have an older population, but. Uh, yeah, uh, but Sarasota is a little bit more affluent than uh, uh, Lily, Pennsylvania. So yeah, it, and it it is uh, a lot of retirees and their parents. There you go. So let's talk about Vuity. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna get through everything tonight, but a lot of a lot of stuff in here. So Vuity was approved October 29th of last year. Uh, basically, cholinergic muscarinic receptor that's out there. Basically, pilocarpine. If you want to remember that. Uh, warnings, poor illumination and, and iritis. And then it says retinal detachment on there. I have a big question mark on there. I think that just got taught at optometry schools at one point and just kind of keeps getting circulated through and taught. And there might, might have been one case maybe associated with it, but uh, at 1.25%, just be aware of it is my opinion. 
Uh, a significant amount of RXs have been written. I was in that KOL meeting. They had a, a number uh, that's proprietary. So we could say significant amount of RXs. And the cool thing is majority haven't been written by optometrists. It's a $79 uh, cost at most pharmacies. Um, they are on their website. They have my viewity points where you buy to buy four and then the fifth one they get for, for free. They have to buy all four, but it's the points. It's like reward system, like for like flying Delta. Eventually you get rewarded with stuff. So you buy four and on the fifth one, you get free. They have the Upscript online pharmacy where you can directly ship to the patient. Um, the key, again, it goes back to that mechanism of action, mechanism of delivery that we talked about re-engineered pilocarpine, optimized the optimized concentration, the fast pH, what they call the, the pH fast technology. You know, it's efficacy, it's got three lines of gain, uh, really helps in that intermediate device uh, uh, vision. And when they did it, they only had 1.3% of the people stop due to adverse events. You know, the fast technology, you know, Tracy has taught me a lot over the years. Uh, pH, you know, you, it has to be at about 4% in the bottle. But when you drop it onto the eye, if it's 4%, it's going to sting like crazy. So, oh, why don't you just make it seven? Well, that's pharmacology, right? You have something that needs to be in an acidic environment. If you put it in a neutral environment, it doesn't work. So it has to be four per, a, a pH of four in the bottle. But what happens is whenever you drop it onto the eye, within seconds, 30 seconds to a minute, it's optimized to the pH. That's their pH or their fast technology that's out there where you can see generic pilocarpine never really changes the pH and burns and burns and burns. Uh, I know that I was just at the tail end of uh, pilocarpine. Again, remember my first lecture was, uh, was, uh, was Zalatan that was out there. Uh, I'm sure Joe has a little bit more experience just being a few years uh, between us uh, with the pilocarpine, but I do know at PCO it was used a lot and boy, did it burn the patient's eyes. So again, P4, P4, the pH of four in the bottle hits the eye quickly within seconds, goes to the pH of seven. And you can see here now, it also has a rapid onset. Here's that 50% reduction of pupil within 20 minutes, as opposed to a generic pilocarpine that's out there that is one hour to get that pupil effect that's out there. So again, mechanism of delivery, still pilo in a sense, maybe reformulated a little mechanism of action change, but more of a mechanism of delivery change that's out there. So what is coming soon? Well, there's a whole bunch in this market. These myotics that are out there. You can see this a little bit of an older slide because as I was looking at this, the, the uh, Allergan, the AGN190584 is now approved. But look at how many are, are coming. So be ready. It's going to be out there. These patients, it's going to be marketed. Patients are already coming in, asking to try it, so on and so forth. So just be familiar with it. And what I think is going to be kind of cool, it's going to be contact lenses, maybe, you know, maybe the stronger uh, medications you'll be doing in one eye and the other eye, like Carbacol in one eye, doing a, uh, um, a, um, like a contact lens monovision effect that's out there. So uh, this is with devices technologies that's out there. So you can see that this space is going to, is getting crowded pretty quickly. Uh, Allergan was the first to market, and this is just kind of showing you the NDAs and phase three, phase one. There's all kinds of, uh, of medications in this pipeline. So be aware of it. Stay at the date. You know, that's why we do education that's out there. And again, just going through LinkedIn the other day, March 16th, um, Oracis here Pharmaceuticals is pleased to announce the completion of their near one, near two phase three studies. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a, a pharmaceutical here that is, uh, um, that's used for presbyopia, right? They're near one, near two. So here they are right here on this graph, and they just completed their phase three, right? They're going to get into their, through their NDAs now, right? So they just concluded their phase three studies. So you're going to be seeing more and more drops 
You're going to see advertisements coming out on these and your patients are patients are already coming in and saying, can I try this? So the good news is it's bringing awareness that's out there. And here's something from Vices that just came in on March uh, 16th right here as an email. I screenshotted it and uh, they're they're pleased to share exciting news about Vices. Um, they hired uh, this person as a vice president and uh, the, the expansion increase footprint of 33% in serving the research and development uh, because of embarking on the phase three clinical trial that's out there. So again, it's happening. Uh, stay you know, educated on it and patients are going to be asking about it because um, there's a lot more patients with presbyopia and dry eye. Right. So I don't know, 70 million versus 30 million uh, with uh, with dry eye. So there's two types of presbyopia drops that are out there. Uh, there's the meiotic agents and the lens softening agents. Most of them right now are meiotic. The lens softening agents, I think, are going to be really, really cool if they can get that figured out and help with the increase in ability to accommodate. This one I thought was neat, Demodex uh, blepharitis, uh, a, a new horizon, a new therapeutic on the horizon. Demodex, you know, this is, when you look at these lashes and you see this little buildup, that's nothing more than parasitic poop, Demodex poop. Uh, that's the cholerets. We like to call it cholerets, but really it's Demodex poop. They secrete and that's what then creates the inflammation that's out there, the redness uh, on there. So, you know, right now, um, you know, we have some good uh, treatments, but there's going to be this TPO3. We don't know what it's going to be called, but it's moving along. And maybe the end of this year or next year, we'll have a, a way to really kill the Demodex uh, rather than uh, using uh, the, the topical treatments that are out there uh, to use it or to, to, to treat these medications. So ocular biologics, uh, I'm gonna hit these real quick and try and land uh, pretty close on time. I think we still have time for a polling question here. So mm -hmm. uh, let's do it. And while the, uh, the poll is coming in, what pre or post testing do you per perform in prescribing viewity? Uh, what pre and post testing, uh, there's always this big discussion out there, you know, do we charge, do not charge. Um, I think one of the, you know, if they're a higher myope, you know, make sure that they don't have any lattice or, you know, risk for retinal detachment. Well, these are for basically the plano presbyopic patients. Um, do I do anything other than look back in the record? Have I dilated them? Do I have a, have a, uh, a documentation of what their peripheral retina looks like. Um, really not much other than say, you know, hey, read this card here. Where do you see? Try it. And if you like it, I'll prescribe it. Um, so, but you know, there's other people out there kind of going through this whole workup, which is nothing wrong with it. I just kind of uh, just trial and error. It. I mean, I educate the patient on it, but I don't do much of a workup other than explain them what the drop is, give them some realistic expectations. Like we're just trying to make your vision better. I mean, you might not get to 2020, but everyone has different thresholds to their acuity up close and they might find it wowing a wow factor just to be able to pick up two lines. And it might be a disappointing factor for someone that picks up four lines. So it's more of a trial and error type of thing. Do you have any experience with it, Joe? Uh, my, my testing or, or my approach, it, it's all subjective, you know, usually at, it, you know, it comes as part of a comprehensive examination when, uh, when it's usually brought up to me and I'm asked about it and that's when I'll give them a sample and I, I let them report, you know, what their, what their thought was. All right. We got some, uh, questions rolling in here. That's the pre, uh, Say something about the lens softening drug. Yeah, I kind of chatted on that, that, that it's out there. Uh, there's a lens softening medication. Um, yeah, it's the increase. I believe it's with Alcon right now, uh, that, that the, the, the lens softening. Uh, that came in private, Joe, you didn't see it. Uh, what percentage, uh, what, 
what percentage approximately of patients on pilot view to get headaches and side effects? Um, it, it, remember, it's a pH of four when it hits the eye. I have it here in my house. I, I play around with it. I had to like literally feel the sting uh, when it hit my eye and then, okay, that's the sting. And then, okay, it got neutralized. Um, I don't have a lot of people having headaches from it. Um, you know, I think in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in, it was a low percentage under 5% reported headaches in the adverse events. Um, I have patients that use it and not really have any problem. What I have with it is a severe dimming, literally as if people like I'm used to working as we all are optometrists in rooms that we adjust the lights. When I first put it in, I'm like looking and going like it's down like 50% in here. Like someone just took a dimmer switch and went down. And because of my pupils being small and then uh, it changed the focal point of my eyes, able to see my floaters a little bit better. Uh, so um, I saw my floaters a little bit more, didn't say an increase in floaters and retinal attachment, not going down that road. I was able to see my floaters better and things were dim, um, but it's kind of cool. I had LASIK. It gets rid of my LASIK. So I went to, uh, ben Roethlisberger's last game. I'm a Steeler fan. And I said, you know what? I'm going to put the viewity in because all it was a night game, all the lights. I get some halos, a little bit of halos. doesn't bother me. But I said, you know what? I want to have a great vision tonight. So I put it in and got rid of my halos. So I think that might be another off-label use. All right. Let's see. What do we have here? Uh, which was the first biologic used in eye care? Everyone's nailed it. Great job, guys. Um, yeah, it was uh, a Vastin that was out there. That was the first biologic that was used. And uh, so we have, you know, been using biologics for years for macular degeneration, but now you see all these different types of biologics on TV that are out there for psoriatic arthritis. And really, instead of using a steroid and, and just squashing the whole immune system, they're really finding just these little targets and receptors to stimulate, upregulate, not let them do what they're supposed to do, block. And that's where you'll see, like at the end, you'll see MAB start stands for monoclonal antibody uh, that's out there. So really the first uh, that we used in eye care was a Vastin. And then there was this big, long drawn out um, um, uh, delay or lag of when the next one came out. But I do want to talk about Bay of You that was, uh, I believe it was Novartis. Yeah, it was Novartis. Uh, that came up with this uh, injection and it was supposed to get out to about three to say six months. It was supposed to just spread out the injections for the patient right here off as a three month dosing schedule. Uh, but what happened is people were getting these complications, uh, about a thousand people, uh, they would get intraocular inflammation, uh, about 50 uh, of the complications, this uh, 1,098, 50 of them got inflammation, 50 of them got inflammation and a retin, uh, a vasculitis, and then a small percentage got an artery occlusion, and then another small percentage lost 15 lines. They were getting this vasculitis or type of artery occlusion, and they were kind of hoping that it was in the process that there was some type of impurity, but after they got digging, they found out that there's a small percentage that have an antibody to this Bay of you. So when you inject it, the body has an immunological reaction. So if you want to use Bay of you, you can literally test to see if the patient has this antibody. So, you know, what retinologist is going to do that? So it's really not catching on. It's not really off the drawing board, but they continue to review and they're trying to figure out ways to try and get a, long, a, a longer VEGF. But that's what happened with Bay of you is that they injected it and they were getting these vasculitis out there and it's patients have antibody towards this medication. So I'm gonna skip the polling question. I'm just gonna hit these at really high levels at the next two to three minutes, just to remind everyone that there's Oxervate that's out there. Oxervate is for neurotrophic keratitis. Um, and so there's a live organism that they use uh, to produce biologics. And in this case, it would be E. coli. Literally, they find out the DNA sequence. They use the E. coli to mass produce it. And the cool thing about uh, uh, Oxervate is that it, it's it mimicking 
endogenous nerve growth factor is what it's doing. And that's what it's helping is it's helping to grow. It's not a monoclonal antibody. Like we're so used to biologics being monoclonal antibody. This is a, uh, a nerve growth factor and it's helping to get that, get rid of that, uh, that down regulation of the trigeminal nerve that has occurred. And here is basically with neurotrophic keratitis, all the different things that can cause it. I like always to point out diabetes because diabetes always gets the retinopathy, but it does create neuropathy. And we usually talk about fingers and toes, but don't forget the eyes can have that issue. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Neurotrophic keratitis, um, it mimics the endogenous nerve growth factor. Here's the nerve growth factor, what it looks like in the body. You can get it and order it. Um, a lot of people like to say, you know, all these biologics are so expensive. Well, the, this, this pharmaceutical company that's from Italy, Dompe, they have foundations. I have about an N of 15. I've done this 15 times on patients. It works great. Everyone has been able to get the medication. They have a med they have a a foundation that's out there. They were smart enough to help a foundation to help these patients. Here's the center German over here in the right or in the left. And here's the endogenous. And I love this slide because basically it just shows how it matches up. All right. Every two hours, six times a day for eight weeks. This is a patient that's doing really well on it. I documented it every week. She came in every week and I did video on it. I just won't take the time to play the videos. All right, there we go. Um, so let me just get out of there. Let's talk about thyroid eye disease. Uh, what happens is it's a uh, it's an autoimmune reaction. Here's a patient with thyroid eye disease, uh, and I just want to get through uh, and talk about Tepeza so that you're aware of it. Tepeza is another one of those biologics, and really you need to know the CAS score, not the not the no specs, not the limo. You need to know that these are all just level ones. This, this isn't a two, like, oh, that's a two pain. These are all just a, a score of one. Painful feeling behind the globe, one. Painful attempt on glaze, uh, on gaze, one. Red eyelids, one. So that would be a total of three. That's not a total of six. That's a total of one. And when you're three and above on the cast score in these first seven, you would want to start reaching out to your uh, persons that are doing the Tepeza infusions because the patient would be a good candidate that's out there. So this gentleman that came in, does he have pain fulfilling behind his globe? Yes. Pain could be a pressure, right? Pain is very subjective. So pressure, pain on attempted gaze. Two, redness of his eyelids. Absolutely. Redness of conjunctiva. Absolutely. Chemosis. Yes. Inflammation. Yes. He's got a seven, right? He's got inflammation of his carbuncle. This gentleman needs Tepeza off to the Tepeza clinic. And what it's doing is it's going after these receptors. It's going after this insulin growth factor one receptor. And they're, they're joined by this beta arrestin down here. Either side will stimulate, whether it's the the thyroid stimulating, or if it's the uh, insulin growth factor, because it is beta arrest and it doesn't need both, one or the other creates the reaction. But what Tepeza does, it comes in on the insulin growth factor, one attaches, and here comes the pharmacological turn, down regulates that receptor, stops the inflammation. Okay. And so it's, it's going, it's an immunosuppressive um, Tepeza is, is a good uh, option. They've used in the past Remicade, Humira, uh, and they're just big, giant immunosuppressors where this one is immunomodulary. It's a, it's, it's a lot less, if you want to say, it's a lot safer on the body that's out there. So there's lots of trials on this. It works. I have two patients that I can't wait to be able to upload their uh, before and after pictures. Again, Tepeza, this patient comes in, you want to go through the first seven, eight, nine, and 10 are for follow-up. You know, yeah, this is for follow-up. Once they're on it, then you can monitor them with eight, nine, and 10. 
So to get them initially in, it's just one through seven. Make sure you know the CAS score, clinical activity score. Yes, this patient here has thyroid eye disease, a five or a six off to the infusion site uh, to see if they can get approved for Tepeza. So there's a lot of biologics out there. They're being used off label. A much safer uh, option is there now. So I want to make sure that we finish up before uh, nine o'clock. So I'm going to pause there and say thank you, everyone. Joe, any other questions that have come in? Uh, no, no questions that have come in. We've uh, we've handled them all throughout uh, throughout the uh, event and throughout the evening. I think everything is. Uh, Looking very good. I, I will echo what you said about the PESA. Uh, the, you know, if, you, if you get a chance to attend uh, an informational promotional talk on that, you'll be very impressed at how well it works. You know, I, I've got a patient that really didn't fall very high on the CAS score, but her MRI showed optic nerve compression, even though it had good vision, no pupil defect, no field defect. You know, there was actual physical compression of the optic nerves on so off, off for Tepeza. Yep, absolutely. And what they're finding too is that you don't, where they're doing a study where patients that are appear to be burnt out, they still have, instead of an acute chronic inflammation or an acute inflammation, they have a chronic. So they're starting a second trial and study where showing these patients that don't have the redness and pain actually get rid of the proptosis because the muscle and fat are still swollen. So I think this medication is going to be very helpful for this condition of thyroid eye disease. 